This is a study on eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. My name is Ariel Lyman Hanavi, and we're working our way through the commentary that I put together using this particular slideshow. So we've already looked at Daniel through some charts and graphs and pictures. Let's now summarize Daniel's prophecies using commentary and scripture. So let's work our way through some more details. This is Daniel's 70 weeks summary and conclusion. From this point forward in the slideshow and in the presentation and the teaching, I'll try to just stick to reading as much as possible since there won't be, there's some pictures in here as well, don't worry, it's not all text. But since the text is meant to prevent me from rambling and staying on top, it'll allow me to stay on topic, I'll simply read. And if I need to pause, I will, but primarily let me just read, okay? Summary and conclusions. The times in which we live become more and more interesting on almost a daily basis. These are my own thoughts that were penned over 20 years ago when I first did this particular study on eschatology. And I have recently decided to reuse this particular commentary. I updated a lot of some of the wording and some of the concepts, but the, the foundational part of it is the same. And yet at the same time, it is simply a summary so it's a, it's it's not very in-depth at this perspective so i decided to use this as the summary and conclusionary part as we're beginning to look at the 70th week of daniel please remember what we're doing at this point in time is we're summarizing what we've already looked at at daniel 9 24 25 26 and 27 using pastor david guzik's material so we're using this material as summary and conclusionary material so there'll be a little bit of repetition as we summarize where we've been all right the times in which we live become more and more interesting on almost a daily basis. Many have begun to look for the return of Jesus Christ for his church and to judge an unbelieving world. What does the Bible teach concerning the end times? This is my viewpoint from a futurist perspective. I say it this way. There's certainly a lot of confusion among Christians as to exactly what the Bible does say about the end times, especially where the church is concerned. I hope that this series of teachings will help dispel some of that confusion. This series aims to offer a broad overview of end times prophecy as revealed in God's word. For those of you who may disagree with some of what you read here, I hope that you will stay with me until the end of this series. Give some prayerful thought to what you read, what you read and what you read, and by all means compare what I have to say with what God has revealed in the Bible. All right. What I want us to be aware of is that in this summary and conclusion, one of the central prophecies of both the first and second coming of Jesus is found in the ninth chapter of Daniel. Let's just read the relevant verses real quick. Starting in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9. I'm not going to read the Hebrew on the right side, but it's there just for reference in case I need it. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, So you turn know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. This is the NASB version of the Bible, by the way. Verse 26, Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And the final Pasuk, verse 27, the final verse, And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And in the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who, and I apologize, the slide got cut off there, but it says on the one who makes desolate. All right. This passage, in my understanding, is known as Daniel 70 weeks or the 70 weeks of Daniel. I say my understanding, but really everybody calls it the same thing. Let's summarize this briefly. First, the term weeks literally means sevens. In context, they refer to years. So we could render verse 24 as, quote, 77s of years are determined for your people and your holy city, etc., etc., end quote. Now, how long a period of time is this referring to? We learned in our studies that 70 times 7 would be 490 years. Israel was given 490 years to complete 
or that is, I'm sorry, 49 years to accomplish these things. We also know that it's not Israel who's doing the things per se. It's God who's orchestrating these things that we're going to be reading about. Indeed, the next six things that I just, that I'm going to show you in the next slide here can only be accomplished by God and his Messiah. They can't be accomplished by Israel itself, but it involves Israel and it involves the Gentile world around Israel. So here, here's the six things that Daniel was told in advance would impact his people from the moment that he was there in Babylon moving forward. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Number five, to seal up vision and prophecy. And number six, to anoint the most holy. And we could almost neatly divide this list of six into three and three. The first three were primarily and even more to the point spiritually accomplished by Yeshua at his first coming. And yet the final three, four, five, and six must be accomplished at a second coming. But overall, we're still talking about things that have both a spiritual as well as a literal fulfillment that we are looking forward to. Let's keep reading. In verse 25, Gabriel told Daniel that from the time the command was given to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah came would be 483 years, i.e. seven weeks and 62 weeks. This is an overview and a summary of what we've already learned. So some of this is repetition. That decree was given by Artaxerxes, you can read, it, read about it in Nehemiah, and it was fulfilled 483 years later when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. In verse 26, we were told that sometime after the 483 years, the Messiah would be cut off. We learned that the literal meaning here is suffer the death penalty. That's how normally the word karat in the Hebrew is used in the Bible to uh to indicate execution, loss of life. But in context, it can also mean uh, what we might call put out of a, group, of a people group or excommunicated from a larger group or something to that effect. We could render this uh, phrase, Messiah will suffer the death penalty, but not for himself, right? Cut off, but not for himself. This, in other words, it was, it was a death that he himself didn't deserve. He died on behalf of, of other people, just like Isaiah chapter 53 teaches us, right? His death was efficacious for us, but it was substitutionary atonement that we're talking about. He paid the price that we ourselves couldn't pay by dying on the cross for us. This brought in the uh, atonement and brought in the salvation that we, we, of course, need. This prophecy was fulfilled not, I'm sorry, this prophecy was fulfilled when Jesus suffered the death penalty on the cross of Calvary, not for himself, but for us. This is important, by the way, for our studies, because whether you're a preterist or a futurist, you have to accept the atoning work of Messiah in order for the rest of the Bible to make sense. We go on to find out that Gabriel continues saying that the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Again, we know that this was fulfilled in 70 AD, just like the preterists say, just like the historicists say, and just like the futurists say. It's probably only, only the idealists uh, who reject wholesale maybe the idea that this has to have had some historical relevance. But if you're a Christian and you're idealist, then you probably also agree that these aspects of 70 AD involved the death of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem and things like that. But we know that this was fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed both the city of Jerusalem and the temple. I call this partial fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy because we know there will be a rebuilt Jerusalem, a rebuilt temple. We're already living in a time when Jerusalem has been rebuilt, but the temple is still yet waiting rebuilding. And yet, when the future Antichrist comes, the people of the prince that is to come, which of course I believe is Antichrist, this people will once again trample Jerusalem for 42 months like we read about in the book of Revelation. So this is Daniel's 70th week, the summary and the conclusions. We're learning more about things that we've already studied, but we are beginning to peel back more and more layers of what Daniel's final 70th week entails. So now let's turn directly into Daniel's final 70th week summary and conclusions. In verse 27, we already studied a little bit of this using Guzik's material, but now we're using my own conclusionary material here in these slides. In verse 27, we began to see some very interesting things. Let's look at this verse very closely once more. Here's Daniel 9, 27 from the NASB. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, 
he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. All right, let's uh, unpack this. In order to gain the best understanding of this verse, I believe that we need to back up to the previous verse and identify who the opening he of this verse, verse 27, is referring to. So I'm going to use two primary resources. First one, a web Bible commentary resource at kingcomments.com has these valuable insights for us to consider. So the next few slides that we're going to see flash by the screen in the italics is from kingcomments.com. Quote, the second part of verse 26 gives a transition from the situation in the year 70 to the situation the in the end of time or the 70th year week. That 70th year week is what we are talking about in verse 27. Daniel, the 70th year week, Israel is back in its land. This is demonstrated by the fact that sacrifices are being made again. There is a temple service again. As I interject, it could be a full-blown temple, which I think has strong merit. It could be a what we might call a portable structure like the tabernacle. All we need is something that allows for sacrifices to be officiated and something that allows for a defilement by the Antichrist himself. That's why I think it's a temple, but again, I could be wrong. It could be just a tabernacle, but either way, it's something that will gain the world's attention when the time comes. Let's continue with this particular web resource. The he of this verse is the prince of the previous verse who will come. It is the ruler of the restored Western Roman Empire, the fourth world empire, the united Europe that gave its power into the hands of a single dictator, the beast from the sea, according to Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. Remember that chart that we looked at earlier? It, it, it points to the time when the Roman Empire is again present and Israel is again present and both empires have a ruler. Let me interject once again. The reason why we... Prophecy buffs believe that it's a restored Roman Empire, a revived Roman Empire, is because when Daniel saw the vision from the king's dream of the statue, as well as his own vision with the four beasts, he didn't really quite probably understand the now and not yet near and far aspect of this fourth metal slash fourth beast as it pertains to being Rome and at the same time being a revived Rome. Right. From his perspective, it simply looked like one beast, one entity, one metal. And yet when we read through the details about the metal and its ten toes and the beast and its ten horns, etc., etc., we begin to realize that Rome simply didn't exhaust all of those details. Ancient Rome doesn't fit the total fulfillment of what we read about in Daniel. There must be more to Rome than than was already uh, presented for us from a historical landscape. Let's keep reading. We're almost done here, about five more minutes left, and then we'll find a, a stopping point and fin pick this up next week. By the way, by way of slides, I've got about 80 slides in this presentation, and we're only on slide number 37, so we're, we're going to work our way through about half of this slideshow, and then we'll pick this up next week. Here's what King Commons has to say. The covenant that he makes, right, the Antichrist, the one that he makes firm is the covenant that he, the autocrat of the United Western Europe, will make with the unbelieving mass of the Jews, the many possibly under the leadership of the Antichrist. Seen from the Jewish side, it is a treaty with death, right? Read Isaiah 28, 15, and 18. They continue, the apostate mass of the Israelites will do this to defend themselves, right, make this covenant, and to protect themselves against the enemies surrounding them, of which the greatest enemy is Assyria, or Syria to the north. I don't think they go by the name of Assyria anymore, they just call themselves Syria, right, which is conveniently, if you look on a map, kind of sandwiched to the north of Israel, right, above Lebanon, you keep going up, right, Lebanon, and then you get up into Syria, and it's bordering with Turkey, and it also borders with Iraq, I believe. So Turkey, Syria, Iraq, you have all of those right to the immediate north of Israel. And all of them take basically almost what we might say an enemy perspective of Israel. So by Assyria, we can understand Syria. They, they, they explain this as well. Syria in an alliance with some other Arab states, and those other Arab states could be perhaps... Iraq and Iran, like right now we've been reading in the news, a lot of news about Iran forming some military 
uh, coalitions and strikes against Israel, attacking Israel at that level. Of course, we know eventually all of the major players there in the Middle East surrounding Israel are going to attack her in some shape or fashion. And this is driven not just by the demonic spirit of Antichrist, which is present in the world today, even if Antichrist himself is not making himself known, but the demonic spirit of Antichrist, which of course is the spirit of Satan, which hates God's people. Israel hates Christians, hates the Messiah, hates God but is hell-bent on destroying Israel as a people group and wiping her off the map, utilizes these, these other Arab states as pawns in his grand scheme to try and defeat God's plans and purposes by the first trying to defeat the Messiah, which he failed at, right? He tried in the first century to kill the Messiah and keep him dead, but of course we know Messiah is very God-veiled in the flesh, so he can't keep him in the grave, right? Baruch Hashem, praise God. But also, as we're drawing our study to the close tonight, we're learning that as we draw closer and closer to more end-time events unfolding in the book of Revelation, coming alive before our very eyes, these Arab states are going to be utilized once again to, as we're going to see, come into focus as they turn their sights on destroying Israel and attacking Israel. And when the 70th week begins to kick off, there will be prominent news about Israel under attack, wars and rumors of wars and things like that. Israel is going to be interested in trying to find and make peace. And maybe even for the first three and a half years, she will have a measured amount of unprecedented peace there in the Middle East. Yet we know that at the midpoint, you know, all hell is going to break loose. So let's keep reading here. Assyria is so strong, according to this website, because it is supported by the mighty Russian Empire that lies north of them. So we have Russia just above those other ones that I just mentioned. And we know Russia is already in the, in the news prominently because of their war on Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this has to do with prophecy unfolding before our very eyes of these key players over in that part of the world. Russia, China, you know, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan and Egypt below Israel. And of course, then we've got Western Rome, which is the European Union and things like that. All of these are going to be major players that will be occupying their places in the end times events. Again, this is what the prophetic word shows and what we see confirmed in current events. As we're drawing our study to a close, let's just uh, uh, look at a few more slides here. Continuing with this quote from King Comments, in the middle of the week, however, a dramatic change takes place. This change heralds the most terrible time the earth has ever experienced. This time is called the Great Tribulation, according to this web resource, Matthew 24, 21, and also the time of Jacob's distress, Jeremiah 31, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. This period will last half a year, week, i.e. three and a half years. In that time, an unprecedented suffering will affect mankind. What people will do to each other defies any description. Violence of war and natural disasters will uninhibitably cause their slaughter. They continue, the spiritual torments to which men are exposed will drive them to insanity. An impressive description of it, of it can be found in Revelation 6 through 9, those chapters. The introductory event is the casting of the devil from heaven to earth, knowing that he has a little time, i.e. three and a half years. And we read about that in Revelation 12, verse 9 and 12, verse, uh, Revelation 12, 9 and 12, B. And what I say in my commentary, and this will provide us with a stopping point and a little bit of cliffhanger, cliff, cliffhanger for next week, that is the end of kingcomments.com and what i say in my own writing is that at this point let us continue our summary of the 70th week of daniel by examining an additional interpretation from a slightly different perspective turning to a christian blog post by the name of the bible says.com here's what they have to say about the events that will unfold in those last days beginning at the midpoint of the week going forward but we're not going to move forward just yet We'll stop right here, and that'll be the end of our study. We'll pick this up next week, and this will probably follow over into the week after, which kind of conveniently poises us for our eventual look at the excursus material from the, the sign book on the Antichrist himself. But that'll do it for eschatology, a biblical study of end-time events. <laughs>